With hurricane season right around the corner, the big question to ask is, are you ready? Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Patterson. On today's show, Community Information Director Dave Byron and his guest, Emergency Management Director Jim Judge, will discuss the important factors in disaster preparedness. Here and now reporter Kendra Lee will bring us a warm and fuzzy segment from the Halifax Humane Society. Horticulture Today's agent Joe Seward shows us efficient ways to water our gardens. Those segments, news and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. I hope you stay tuned. Coming on the heels of the creation of a two-mile opportunity zone to spur hotel development in the core beach area of Daytona Beach, the Volusia County Council has taken a second step that could lead to the extension of the existing beachfront boardwalk. While a raw concept at this point, the County Council gave the green light to an initial study that would identify the needed steps to create a continuous board from University Boulevard on the north to Silver Beach Boulevard with a connection to the existing boardwalk in front of the historic band shell and renovated pier. County Manager Jim Deneen presented the idea during the May 21st County Council meeting. Uh, the Council liked that idea. Um, we've since gotten a lot of feedback and all the feedback's been positive. Obviously there's a lot of obstacles we have to overcome. We're planning on doing that. And at the meeting on June 11th, um, I'll be coming forward with a, a plan, okay, on what, on how should we should tackle investigating this idea. So what we'll be looking for on the 11th is what things we would do next to start the ball rolling. So, well, I think anytime you make connectivity between hotels like that, that what you do is you provide a, a greater opportunity mm -hmm. for success for businesses. And whether it's that success spurs new growth, it spurs people to expand, to take chances, and and develop new opportunities to shop. The boardwalk proposal builds on momentum to boost tourism in the newly created Opportunity Zone, which allows new development and existing sites in the core district to invest in their properties in exchange for the elimination of beach driving behind their properties. The Echo Half Marathon June 7th at Gemini Springs Park in DeBerry will coincide with the celebration of National Trails Day. The annual celebration will be from 7 to 10 a.m. The outdoor event will be set up at the finish line of the Echo Half Marathon, which is being held in the park on the same day. <laughs> County staff will lead a guided nature hike and a walking tour through the picturesque park, while the River to the Sea Transportation Planning Organization will give away free children's bicycle helmets. The event also will include children's activities and informational stations. Gemini Springs Park offers fishing, camping, and canoeing throughout the 210 acres of natural lands. It's also a popular spot for bikers and hikers as it provides a trailhead for the county's Spring to Spring Trail. Parks Recreation and Culture Director Tim Bailey said this is going to be a fun event for everyone. National Trails Day's annual event brings awareness to Volusia County Trails program and inspires the public and trail enthusiasts to seek out their favorite trails. They can discover and participate in educational exhibits, hikes, and other fun activities. It's going to be a great event. I encourage all, uh, everyone to come out there, bring your family. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Volusia County Council supports the development of trail systems because trails improve the quality of life. For more information about the county's trails program, you can visit volusia.org slash trails. I'm Joshua Wagner with the Volusia County Council. If you're going to one of our beautiful beaches, have a great day and come back often. If you drive on the beach, please observe the 10 mile per hour speed limit and be very careful of pedestrians, especially children. If you're visiting with children, watch them constantly and take small children by the hand when crossing traffic lanes. You might want to use one of our traffic free zones. For more beach information, please visit volusia.org. A pet can be a great addition to almost any home. What many people don't know is that owning a pet can also provide tangible health benefits. 
Here and Now reporter Kendra Lee takes us to the Halifax Humane Society to learn more. Halifax Humane Society is one of the few comprehensive, full-service, and open admission humane societies in the entire state. The nonprofit operates 36 different programs, from medical all the way to behavioral, while also offering some specialized programs to provide some insight into the health benefits for the potential pet owners. There are tons of health benefits that pets can bring into our life. Everything from basic companionship, we all know that, the great joy they bring into our life, but a lot of people don't realize that joy is a component of um, you know, the positive things in our life. And without that joy, there are other things that, that, that could be detrimental to us, such as depression. Um, you know, lack of companionship has been proven to turn into things like cardiovascular disease, uh, lameness. Miguel explained that dogs not only get us outdoors, and cats provide that great sense of companionship, but they also help pet owners with cardiovascular health, activity levels, help children learn about responsibility, and provide family-friendly activities directly linked to overall family wellness. Well, I have depression, so I was um, like getting therapy and stuff. I learned that like dogs are very therapeutic for depression because they like um, they know you. Like once they get to know you, they know you're sad. They can comfort you, hug you, like things like that. So that's why I wanted a dog. The Humane Society takes in close to 25,000 animals per year through their various programs, but has centered one program around meeting the perfect pet for your wellness level. Our Meet Your Match program is essentially a match.com, um, almost like a dating service for pets and people. Uh, essentially it profiles our pets very lightly um, on, based on behavior, different uh, preferences, wants, behavioral patterns that they have, how playful, how inquisitive they are. And then we ask you some very lighthearted questions as a potential adopter. Here at Halifax Humane Society, Meet Your Match cards are available for almost every animal. Green cards are available for more high energy animals. Orange cards are available for animals that are a little bit more middle of the road. And purple cards are available for animals that are a little bit more mild. We have a great website that has a live inventory. All of the pets that come in, as soon as they come in, they go live on our website. As soon as their personality match, their card is now available online too, or their, their profile is available online too. And remember, the health benefits of owning a pet aren't limited to dogs and cats. Halifax Humane Society also offers several birds and small rodents for adoption. To learn more about the Meet Your Match program and find the perfect pet for your wellness goals, visit HalifaxHumaneSociety.org. For Volusia Here and Now, I'm Kendra Lee. You know, Florida is known for its rainy season and daily showers. If you grow vegetables and plants, then you know the importance of watering efficiently as one of the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping. Our horticulture agent, Joe Seward, shows us how collecting rainwater and using solar power can be an effective and efficient way to water your garden. Hi, I'm Joe Sewards and welcome to Horticulture Today. This is another update on our landscape project. As you know, last year we got a grant from Volusia County to update our landscape here at the Extension Office. And part of that project includes what we call edible landscaping. We're trying to show folks how they can be more sustainable in their own backyards. Part of this project includes cisterns. You've all heard about rain barrels. Well, cisterns are essentially a giant rain barrel. They have a lot more capacity and will provide a lot more water for your landscape, harvested rainwater. We have two cistern systems here in the edible landscape. The total capacity for both systems is about 1,500 gallons. And these are gonna provide all the water that we need and more. Everything here will be watered with low volume irrigation, conserving water and helping to keep our vegetables healthy by not getting the foliage wet. And this is all going to be done with harvested rainwater. Another aspect of the system is that the cisterns, the pumps that power the cisterns, will be powered with solar power. So essentially, all of the water going to this garden will be off the grid. It'll be harvested rainwater, and it'll be powered with solar power. 
The solar panel that will power the pumps will be on top of the roof of the auditorium here at the extension office. That should supply us with an uninterrupted supply of electricity to power the pumps and keep our garden properly irrigated. We are also adding an element of productivity to the landscape. Again, this is a demonstration and teaching garden, and folks are welcome to come out here and learn about some of the things that we're doing here in terms of vegetable gardening and rainwater harvesting. The systems that you see behind me represent two different systems. One was manufactured in Germany and one was manufactured here in the United States. They both collect rainwater, they'll both run essentially off solar power. It's just a matter of personal preference. There are several different cistern systems out there. All you have to do is search the internet and there are many, many retailers selling cistern systems. There are no advantages or disadvantages, they're just different. This is called the Fat Boy, it holds 650 gallons. These are manufactured in Germany and they have the additional ability to be buried in the ground. So if you don't want to look at them, you can bury those in the ground so that you don't see them. But the principles are the same no matter what type of system that you choose. They're going to collect rainwater and they're going to provide water for our edible landscape here. For more information on cisterns, you can contact us here at the University of Florida Extension in Volusia County. Our phone number is area code 386-822-5778 or you can visit us on the web at volusia.org slash extension. For Horticulture Today, I'm Joe Sewards. Time now to head into the studio to join our very own Community Information Director, Dave Byron, as he sits down for a chat with his guest, Volusia County's Emergency Management Director, Jim Judge. Well, thank you, Amber, and hi, everyone. You know, it's been 12 years since Volusia County was ravaged by three hurricanes within six weeks. That was 2004. The Atlantic hurricane season for Florida has been relatively quiet since then, but that having been said, Florida is the state that's the most vulnerable to hurricane activity. Hurricane season officially begins June 1st, and that means it's time to get ready, just in case one of those storms should come our way. Today we have with us in the studio Volusia County's Emergency Management Director, Jim Judge. We're going to talk about hurricane season and what you need to do to be prepared. Jim, how you doing? Doing well, Dave. Thanks so much for having me on the show today. Hey, like I say every year, I want to wish you a very quiet, peaceful hurricane season. Well, and I appreciate that. We, <laughs> we hope it is a quiet, peaceful hurricane season, but you know, you never know what the season may bring. So, you know, obviously our Time mantra to be ready. is be prepared. You know, Jim, uh, like I say, it's been 12 years or so since uh, 2004 uh, that we had back to back to back uh, three hurricanes in yes. uh, six weeks. Been, but it's been 12, 13 years, whatever the amount is, since the, the, those storms came our way, been relatively quiet. Is there any concern on your part about complacency? Well, absolutely, Dave. You know, I think that uh, the further those events are in the rearview mirror, we, we just kind of lose track of, of uh, the need to prepare and the need to be thinking about uh, what, what may happen should right. a hurricane come our way. So we work very hard every year and even all year long right. to make sure that our residents are thinking about preparedness about having a family plan and what they can do to protect themselves. Uh, this year we'll probably do over 125 community presentations from small groups to very large groups right. including the business community to be able to continue to spread the word of preparedness. I think one of the difficult things for, for you and your folks, uh, Jim, is the fact that Florida being Florida, uh, every day there are new people moving into the state of Florida and not having had the hurricane experience and so probably makes it just a little bit more difficult for them to you know to take these storms seriously and preparation seriously. It's the truth Dave and you know so many uh, of our northern folks that have moved into Volusia County you know they're used to the winter weather and right. what to do in the snow and and uh, we do get a lot of phone calls from people who are new to the area and right. are concerned which we love because then we can talk to them we can provide them with a wealth of information and booklets pamphlets and uh, even how to prepare their home, things that they need to have on hand in the pantry, sure. whatever it takes to help them feel a little bit more at ease. But yet, you know, we're so grateful that they take the opportunity to pick up the phone and call us. Sure. Jim, uh, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, you keep tabs on, 
on you know what what it's likely to be this year what, when you look at the information and and uh, the data and so forth what does this year's hurricane season look like well that's a great question dave and right now it looks like it's going to be a very mild hurricane season in fact the average year is about 12 named storms right. six hurricanes and then three category three or greater right. but this particular year dr gray has already come out with his forecast and of course, Dr. Gray is the meteorologist who works out at the University of Colorado. Right. And we always look forward to getting his uh, predictions on things or forecast on the hurricane season. And he has it at, uh, at seven named storms, six named storms, I'm sorry, six named storms, uh, three hurricanes, and only one potentially severe storm. So very mild. That's good news. It is. And in, in the Hurricane Center, the Miami Hurricane Center and National Weather Service, their forecast will come out at the end of this week. But the deal is, Jim, if you only have one storm and it hits your community, you had a bad year. Boy, it's a true, Dave. And, <laughs> you, and you had know, a bad year. Um, in El, it, of course, we're looking at a very strong El Nino year, right. which means that we're going to get the jet stream is going to dip down very low. We're going to get the west to east flowing winds, which usually prevents the hurricanes Blowing from away. forming, but it's going to blow them out to the Atlantic. Right. And uh, all the models are in agreement that it's going to be a very strong El Nino. So that's the reason that we have a reduced uh, forecast for hurricanes. But the bad news is that when we have a strong El Nino, going into the winter months, we could have very severe weather, chance for a higher level of tornadoes wow. and severe thunderstorms. So there's a, a good side for the hurricane season and also uh, a dangerous side, right. what we can expect in the winter months. Jim, let's talk about uh, Volusia County Emergency Management. What is your role, uh, both statutorily and, and so forth, uh, when one of these storms comes our way? Well, you bet, Dave. Uh, we work under Statute uh, 252, which is the state statutes that governs emergency management with all of our roles and responsibilities at the local level. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that state statute, then we have county ordinances that play into it. And some of the requirements are that the county have an emergency management director. Right. We have to maintain a comprehensive emergency management plan. Uh, we're very involved in grants. Uh, our community rating system, which right now we're to class five, which means that the citizens of Volusia County get a 25% reduction on their flood insurance policies. We also are very much involved in the local mitigation strategy. So there's lots and lots of things that uh, under the statute and under ordinances that uh, encompass our responsibilities. Jim, uh, you know, in, in the decision-making process, um, let's say that there's an evacuation directive or let's say that uh, there's a need for curfew or an ordinance to prevent price gouging and all of that right. sort of thing. Who, who actually makes those decisions? Who's yes, sir. That would be Mr. Deneen. Uh, we would form the manager's advisory group, which right. Mr. Deneen heads up. And then we have our elected officials, department heads, uh, the sheriff, obviously VIPs in the community that would come together. My job would be to give the county manager and those individuals the best information that we have. We're going to be doing conference calls with the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, so that Mr. Deneen and the Manager's Advisory Group has the best information at hand. Mm -hmm. And then from that, Mr. Deneen, ultimately, we, we would declare a local state of emergency if we saw a storm coming in right. that we knew was going to uh, create problems and potential damage for Volusia County. We could go ahead and, and uh, with the County Council, with Chairman Davis, uh, go ahead and do a uh, local state of emergency and then once that's in place, then Mr. Deneen is the man. He's Who's in charge. It? Just, just so the folks uh, that may not follow county government, Mr. Deneen is the county manager. The county manager, yes, sir. Right. So we would, make, uh, we would make recommendations. We would provide Mr. Deneen with the information, as would the advisory group. But then ultimately the decision for curfews, closing schools, uh, evacuating the barrier island, would all fall on Mr. Deneen's shoulders. Right. Now, I know there's a big sign in, uh, in your uh, EOC out there that says emergency management is a team sport. Um, welcome to the team. Yes. Um, where do the cities fit into the picture, Jim? Well, the cities are obviously partners. You know, we call it cooperation, collaboration, and coordination with everyone involved. Right. So within the operations center and in the operations room, every municipality has a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. We have uh, 20 emergency support functions. Our universities are represented, the airport, FEMA, uh, Department of Transportation. So we have 90 different positions in that emergency operations center, but, but the municipalities are the partners. Right. And obviously you have the municipal, the municipal coordinating group that would also play into the role of the uh, advisory group right. in, in working with uh, 
with the, Mr. Deneen? I guess uh, the, the uh, thought is, is that uh, all of that information from all these various points flows into the EOC, and then those decision makers will have that information at their disposal, yes. hopefully to make the best decision collectively for the community. Yes, sir. And then also, you know, there, there's an air cone with, within the Hurricane Center that the hurricane can move uh, up to 174 miles in right. different directions. Which is so, wider than the state of Florida. Exactly. And if you look back, uh, I remember this past winter season when the city of New York uh, was poised to get a horrific storm. Right. So based on the best information for the National Weather Service, they shut the city down. Right. And as the weather can be unpredictable, it dodged right. New York City. And so there were questions about, well, why did they close the city? Why did they do what they did? Right. But yet when you have the best information, you make the best decisions. Because if they had not have evacuated and taken and closed down the city, the transportation and so on, and that storm would have hit, people would have lost their lives. There would have been people stuck on the highways, in trains, and so so forth. So those decisions are very difficult, and they're certainly not taken lightly. Yeah, I was going to uh, emphasize that, Jim, uh, because those decisions are heavy, heavyweight decisions. I mean, when you're talking about an evacuation, which potentially shuts down businesses and all this sort of thing, uh, I guess the message in there to the public is, is when those directives go out, um, there's every reason to believe that there's uh, some potential harm to the citizens and they should heed those uh, directives. Absolutely, Dave. And, and uh, you know, just this past year, we had Craig Fugate, uh, the director for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, paid a visit to our EOC. Right. I've had the good fortune of knowing Craig for many years. And uh, he spoke with Mr. Deneen about, you know, evacuating the barrier island and right. looking at the weather and, and, and being able to, what we call, pull the trigger. Right. Because at a certain point, you have to make the decision to take the protective actions that need to be taken in order to get people out of harm's way off the barrier island because you want everybody evacuated, sheltered, bedded down before sure. the start of those tropical storm force winds. I'm glad you mentioned uh, F FEMA for, for a minute, uh, Jim, because, um, you know, every time there's a major storm, FEMA does what it can do to come in and respond and provide federal resources and reimbursement and that sort of thing. But I think, and correct me if you disagree, but I think that there is a, a misunderstanding of what FEMA's role really is. And what we've always said is that the primary responders are those right here in the community, not yes. FEMA. Is that, am I right no, on that? No, you're correct. Uh, every disaster is local. Right. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we're prepared to respond, that we pull the trigger at a certain time frame to be able to get people out of harm's way. But obviously the biggest thing is then getting into the recovery phase, you know, looking right. after our citizens, helping get our businesses open, helping get roads cleared, power on, right. and get people back to work in as quick amount of time as possible. Right. So that, you know, we don't uh, hurt the economy any, any worse than, the, than we have to. So, you know, while the preparedness is important and, and we work hard all year long on that, and then of course when we get into the response mode right prior to, but then of course the recovery is just absolutely critical that we go to work and of course, public works, you know, we call them the hidden heroes of public right. safety. Right. Because when a storm is over with, it's going to be our county and municipal public works departments are going to get those roads cleared. Right. Because we can't get the power turned on, we can't get fire, EMS, and law right. enforcement until the roads are cleared. So, um, you know, public works plays a huge role, but then also in the debris removal, the debris monitoring. Right. Um, all those activities are huge. And, and then also, uh, you know, Morgan, Morgan Gilruth, our property appraiser, nobody does damage assessment better than he does right. and with his staff and uh, we've got training coming up with them here in about two weeks and uh, Morgan of course and his staff play a large role in our hurricane exercise but of course when we have damage it's so important to get those numbers so we can match right. other counties with the state to get that federal declaration. You know Jim uh, I said at the opening that uh, you know Florida is the most vulnerable to hurricanes of all the 50 states and uh, we know that and uh, I've always heard it said that um, as a result of the vulnerability of the state of Florida, that the state of Florida itself, when you look at all the counties and the state and, uh, system and so forth, we have a really, really good emergency response system. In fact, F Florida, I think, is regarded as having the best emergency management process. Well, I would agree with that, Dave. And, and the, the state is broken into regions. And an right. example of how we work together is we just participated in the statewide hurricane exercise. Right. We did that over two days. But even a two weeks before we practiced locally with our partners in the emergency support functions and our municipalities, 
we brought our Region 5 together, which are Volusia County all the way down to Martin County, including Lake County, Osceola, Orange County, Seminole County. We all came together with emergency managers and our staff to talk about the hurricane simulation that we did with Hurricane Gibson. Because as that storm came in through Palm Beach County, people are going to get on the highways. Come so north. Yeah. They're going to come north, so we're going to be looking at not only being a host county, but right. then also discussing how we're going to work together. If Martin County or St. Lucie County pulls the trigger on their evacuation, where are the people going to go? What messages are they going to put out? And then Brevard County, obviously, is going to be crucial to what we're doing. Right. And then, of course, while Flagler County is in a different region of the state, we work very closely with Flagler because they're next door a, neighbor. To they're the our north. next door neighbor. They're a contiguous county. Uh, Kevin Guthrie, the emergency management director, is a good friend. Uh, Kevin comes down, participates in our training programs. We go up to his shop. Right. Uh, so it, it really is a small world <laughs> in emergency management. So that when we had the flooding back in September and November, you know, my phone rang right away with emergency managers from around the state. Just tell us what you need, when you need it, and they'll be there for us. So that's the type of relationship that exists around the state that if we were to be impacted, uh, we're going to have people coming to assist us get that recovery process underway quickly. Jim, uh, information is the key here. Uh, for people out there that are watching this and uh, perhaps they want to get more preparation information, uh, more information about who does what, how do people get more information? If they would like us to come out to community centers, mobile home parks, churches, we love to go out and do programs. Uh, while we on average do about 125 a year, we'd, we'd much rather make it 500 because the more we get out into the community, the better. We have a wealth of information, but then also you can go to volusia.org backslash emergency, wealth of information there. There's ready.gov for FEMA, redcross.org. And uh, you know, the one thing that I recommend, get the check sheets, you know, so right. that as, as you put that up on the refrigerator, whether you're building your kit with your weather alert radio, your hand crank or battery operated radio, the flashlights, the batteries, you know, and you don't have to go out and spend all that money at one time. Right. Put 25 or $30 aside a paycheck and go out, you know, and, and just check it off as you go. In a, in a very short amount of time, you know, you've got, you got it, it ready to go. Got it ready. The pantry's full. and Well, Jim, uh, we've got a lot more to talk about. We're out of time for today. Yes, sir. But if you're uh, willing, we'll have you back again next week, and we want to talk some specifics about preparation. So are you willing to come back? Yes, sir, Dave. Our guest today, Jim Judge, he's the Emergency Management Director with Volusia County. As we just said, uh, Jim will be back with us next week and we'll talk some specific information about how you and your family need to be prepared for hurricane season. And with that, we'll go back to you, Amber. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Patterson. Have a wonderful evening.